Well, good morning to you. We're so used to saying good Sunday morning. <laughs> but it's not Sunday, this is Tuesday. And uh, I was telling someone last night I was going to Clinch Co. and uh, going to preach. There'd be some other preachers there preaching. And he said, It's not Sunday. Well, it doesn't have to be Sunday to have good preaching, does it? If you would this morning take your Bibles, go to Romans chapter 8. And uh, I'm going to talk this morning just for a little bit about if God be for us, who can be against us? Yeah. You know, there are times in our ministry, in our Christian lives, that it would be good to have a little bit of encouragement as preachers. Sometimes we need that encouragement. Sometimes we need a little bit of uplifting, don't we? As you know, Romans 8 contains a, a wealth of spiritual truth. And I want to read just a few verses there. Um, we'll look at uh, 1 through 18. In this chapter, the Apostle Paul lays out emphasis on what God is to his people and what he's done for them. Then suddenly he'll burst out that question. If God be for us, who can be against us? And think about it this way. If God be for us, who or what can successfully be against us? Mm -hmm. Romans chapter 1, or chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwelleth in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For ye live, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children and heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Let's pray once more. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, as we look into your word here in Romans chapter 8, may we be encouraged and uplifted because, Lord, we'll see here that you are for us. We know the devil's against us. He's against everything that's good. He's against our church, against our people, against our families. But, Lord, we know that through thee we can be victorious. Lord, we just ask your blessing on our time together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, in this chapter... Paul lays emphasis on what God is to his people and what he has done for them. And God has done so much for each of us. Notice the word if that Paul uses. That word if does not denote doubt, but a conclusion, a consequence, or an affirmation signifying sense. I want you to realize that God is for us. And if God's for us, nothing or no one can successfully be against us. God is all-powerful. Satan's not all-powerful. The forces of evil are not all-powerful. You know, that ought to encourage us as preachers to know that if God's for us, nothing can successfully be against us. 
We all know that there's plenty of opposing forces against the church. There's plenty of opposing uh, forces against the Christian. And nothing can successfully overthrow God's work. We've seen in the past year several things happen. We've all been hit by COVID. All of our churches have been affected there. and uh, It has hurt very much. The flooding here in Kentucky has hurt many churches. Sports and other activities compete for our time. It hurts our churches. Satan will throw every stumbling block he can at us to keep us and keep the people of God from God's house. Thank God for the thankful for the faithful few. And uh, you know, we need to be encouraging that faithful few right. because they could be like those that are not so. And we thank God for those faithful saints. Here are a few verses to keep in remembrance. In Isaiah 54, 17, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment shall be condemned. This is the heritage of the saints of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Then Jeremiah 1, 19, And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. In the New Testament, we have 1 John 4 and 4. There we read, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And Psalm 118.6, The Lord is on my side. were not you glad the Lord's on our side today? The Lord's on my side. I will not fear what man can do to me. The worst thing man could do to you, preacher, is kill you. And if man were to kill you, he just promoted you to glory. Yeah. Ain't that something? I'm glad God is for us. We get saved, born again, and then God's on our side. And yes, there are things that will come against us. Some think that you become a Christian, everything's just bed of roses, everything's going to be great and wonderful, and you'll have no problems. It would be nice if that was true. The old devil is after us. He wants to destroy us. He wants to destroy our families. In John 10, 10, it calls him the thief and says he comes but for to steal, kill, and destroy and not only just life, but he wants to, to, to kill our relationships. He wants to destroy our families. He wants to take away things from us. But I'm glad that, that verse goes on and talks about Jesus. He came to give us life and give it more abundantly. I'm glad we have that abundant life. We want to notice some things that are against us as Christians. In Romans 8, here are seven that are against us. Condemnation there in verse 1. Condemnation is against us. This is our state apart from grace. We're condemned, guilty, without hope. We're lost and headed to hell. And there's a penalty we must pay. Verse 1 said, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Think about that. In Christ Jesus, we're not under condemnation. The penalty of sin, we don't have to pay. The wages of sin is death. That's the condemnation that hangs over every man's head. Oh, but when you come to Jesus, that condemnation's removed. Amen. It's gone. We're no longer under condemnation. Preacher, aren't you glad God's on your side today? Many of our folks that come through our doors on Sunday mornings, and I say Sunday mornings because a lot of them don't come back Sunday night, do they? A lot of them don't show up for Wednesday night. But many of our folks that come through our doors are under condemnation. They're lost. They're in need of a Savior. And that's the way the devil wants to keep them. God can change that. He can take all that away. We need our churches full of sinner people. We need our churches full of those that are lost and on their way to hell. They need to come under the sound of the word of God. They need to come under the power of the Holy Spirit so conviction can come. They'll realize that need of Christ and not just realize it, but they'll accept him as their Lord and Savior. Condemnation hangs over their head, but that can all change. Another thing that is against us is sin. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. We're all sinners. Just old filthy, dirty, rotten sinners. Some are saved by grace. Some of those that walk through our doors on Sunday morning are not saved by grace. The wages of sin is death, that separation from God. And for the Christian, sin will drive a wedge between the saved and, and between God. It'll hinder our prayer life. It'll hinder our relationship with God. 
It'll hinder our relationship with others. Sin will hold back, hinder our plans as we try to move forward. And I'm sure in your churches, you've been laying plans for this year. Probably already got your schedule laid out for the year. You probably already looked at vacation Bible school. You probably already thought about your spring meeting or a good Friday service or your Easter service. Maybe your homecoming, your celebrations this year. We lay plans out there. Satan wants to hinder those plans. You may have a youth rally scheduled or a, a revival meeting and plan on filling up your church. Satan has other thoughts, other plans. We need to realize that our church is only going to be as spiritual and as on fire for God as the people that are in it. If our people are not where they need to be with God, how can we expect our church to grow and prosper? Would you bless a disobedient child? God's not going to bless a disobedient person or a disobedient church. This is one of the reasons that many of our people are so miserable. They're not where they need to be with God. You see that every Sunday, every service. You can tell when people are not where they need to be. Sin holds us in bondage, but Jesus sets us free. Yeah. Our people need to know that the Lord can make them free. We see something else against us is that sinful nature. How many times, preachers, do we want to do good and sometimes we blow it, we mess up? We're not always on top of the world, are we? Sometimes we're down in the valley. That sinful nature, <clears throat> verse 8, says, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Sometimes we get in the flesh. Sometimes we're not doing things that please God. Sometimes it's that thought process. Sometimes it's what's going on. Sometimes we may be like Peter when he was out on the water and we take our eyes off the Lord just for a moment and look at what's going on around us in the world and it kind of just pulls us down. Even though most don't want to admit it, we all have that sinful nature. When was the last time you were ticked off? Maybe something at home, maybe something in the family. Maybe one of your church members said something that just got under your skin. When was the last time you were ticked off, lost your cool, thought or said something you shouldn't? When was the last time you messed up? Have you prayed about it? Preacher, when was the last time you prayed for someone that is struggling with this battle? We don't see too many of our people coming and say, Preacher, pray for me. Preacher, pray with me. I'm going through a difficult time. We need more of that. We do. Let them know that we don't need to feed that old nature. We need to feed the new nature. Feast upon the things of the Lord. Hey, God is on your side. People need to know that. That's why many of them are so down. Their sufferings, verse 18 said, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Not one of us is exempt from suffering. Believe it or not, bad things do happen to good people. Believe it or not, preachers sometimes suffer, go through difficult times. And we all know that the devil's out there to devour and do harm to God's people. Sufferings can get us down. They can also make us stronger. Keep relying on God. If we suffer for Christ's sake, like some of the apostles said, count it a joy. They counted it a joy when they were beaten and put in prison. I don't know about you, but I would find it hard to be happy to suffer, to hurt, to be in pain, to be chained up or beaten, cast into prison. Paul and Silas were able to sing praises to God at midnight. There was deliverance there. They were suffering for Christ. They could joy in that. We get down and out sometimes over the least little thing. Decay is against us. Verse 21 said, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption unto the glorious liberty of the children of God. Decay is against us. Believe it or not, preacher, you're dying. You're not going to be around too much longer. Life is short at its longest. We have no promise of tomorrow. We all have an appointment with death. It might scare us if we saw when that date was. Yeah. One day, <clears throat> we'll lay this old body down. You don't know when it'll be. I don't know when it'll be. 
but it is coming. But with God on our side, we'll pick up a new body, a glorified body, a Christ-like body. There'll be no more suffering, no more sickness, no more pain, no more devil to be after us. What a day that will be. But until then, we need to be busy about the Lord's work. If there's something you want to do, something you want your church to do, you need to be busy about it. Because if we're not taken out of this world by death, just our physical condition, we're going to get to the point that we're not physically able to do what we did. Are you able to do what you did 10 years ago? Are you able to hang drywall or paint walls or climb ladders? I came up those steps out there and on these knees I said, whoa, wow. I saw the handicap ramp. You know, there's a lot of things against us. Pain, we all know what that is. Verse 6 said, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Um, pain. If you don't know what it is, that verse didn't have anything to do with pain. If you don't know what it is, take a hammer and hit your thumb. I bet when they was remodeling your church, somebody probably hit their thumb. It hurt. There was pain there. If you don't know what it is, let someone break your heart. There's pain there. It hurts. There are many kinds of pain. Jesus is the pain healer. In heaven, there'll be no more pain, no hurt or sorrow. Remember, God's on our side. Our people need to know that. We need to share that with them, that God's on their side. He can help them get through whatever the situation is they may face. All right, thank you. Verse 22 for your pain there. Weakness, verse 26. Weakness. It says, likewise, the Spirit also help of our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Weakness, we look around and we can see people have grown weaker and weaker as time goes on. Just as this body goes weak, often we get weak spiritually. As a child of God, when we're weak, He will lift us up. He'll encourage us. Many are not encouraged because they never get into the Word of God. They don't communicate with the Lord. They don't read the word. They don't let him speak to them. They're so busy about other things. And therefore they grow weaker and weaker. It's as if they're not getting nourishment. And that body begins to, to grow weak. But he will strengthen us. Remember what Paul said, when I am weak, then am I strong? You see, what it would do, it would drive him to prayer, to a closer relationship with God. And we need to have that close relationship with him. Now over all these things that come against us, we can write the words, the devil. Because he's against us all the time. 1 Peter 5, 8 says he's like that roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He wants to destroy. But if all these things are against us and the devil himself is against us, if God is for us, who can really successfully be against us? I'm glad God's on my side. How about you? Amen. We know that God is for us because he has given us his son. We've looked at some things that's against us. Now we're going to look at, at God's for us. In verse 3, chapter 8, it says, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. And then at verse 32, He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? What more could God do than to send his own Son? Send him in this world to be the savior of the world. Surely this is sufficient proof that God loves us. Just look at John 3, 16. Notice back in verse 32 there that he told not only that God did not withhold his son, but he delivered him up for us all. Not just the good, not just the saved, but for all mankind. Salvation's available, it's free. But one must have to accept that free gift. Here we have reference to the purpose for which Christ came in the world and that was to become the sacrifice for our sins and to offer himself upon the cross of Calvary. Remember what John said in 129, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Well, we can get excited about that. Jesus came to take away the sin of the world. Regardless of how bad a person's been, regardless of what they've been into, regardless of what crime or what sin they've committed, Jesus died for them. 
He'll save them. He'll forgive that sin. They may have to pay the penalty, the consequence of that sin, but they can be forgiven. And when God forgives, He wipes that slate clean. It's as if we had never sinned. We also read in verse 32 that with the gift of His Son, God guarantees to give us all things. That is all that we need for time and eternity. Preachers, God will provide. He will give you what you need for the ministry. Many times we don't have because we don't ask. We don't pray. We don't talk to God. Sometimes we doubt. We don't believe. Our faith grows weak. Ask Him to give you more ministry. Expand your ministry. Ask Him to, to give you more stuff. Ask Him to give you more property. Have you prayed about that? Expand. More people. More finances. All this so you can do more for Him. Not so we can say we're Faith Baptist Church or Calvary Baptist Church, but for His honor and for His glory. When was the last time you asked God to give you something specific? We want to see souls saved. Ask God. Talk to God about it. We know that God is for us because He settled the question of sin. In verses 1 and 3 and 33 and 34, we read that through the gift, the sacrifice, the resurrection, and the present intercession of our Lord Jesus Christ, the whole question of our sin has been settled once and for all by Him. Apart from Him, we're condemned. In John chapter 3 and verse 18, it tells us about condemnation. It also tells there that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. But now because He died as our sin bearer, our Savior and substitute, we're no longer under condemnation. We can charge us, or condemn, who can charge us or condemn us? The devil, of course. He'll try to do that. But we have the answer there in 33 and 34. Because the Lord Jesus Christ has died and risen, been exalted to the right hand of God the Father, he's there to make intercession for us. God has justified us once for all. We are victorious. God is for us. Amen. We know that God is for us because he's given us his spirit. The person of the Holy Spirit is mentioned 20 times in this chapter. Why has God given us his spirit? He's there to indwell us. He indwells us to give us life. His indwelling guarantees our resurrection. He is our emancipation. He is our constant guide. He gives us assurance that we really are the Lord's and he indwells us to be our helper. We know that God is for us because he's adopted us into his family and made us join heirs of his son. Aren't you glad you're a child of God? Notice the word adoption here. Uh, verse 15, 14, 15 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. wonder how many of our people in church Realize that they're a child of God. They don't act like it sometimes. They don't look like it sometimes. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I wonder how spirit-led they are. 15 says, For you have not received the spirit of adoption, again the fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. I always like to say an adopted child is a special child. Adopted child was a chosen child. Mommy and Daddy chose that child. Our Heavenly Father chose us. Thank you, Lord. That word adoption. Try to grasp this marvelous thought that God has brought us into his family. He's made us join heirs with Christ. We can cry, Abba, Father. Join heirs with Christ. What's his is ours. Hey, heaven's going to be our eternal home. We know that God is for us because he has promised us all things will work together for our good. We don't always see why or how this is good. God sees the whole picture. We don't. Many will pray, you know, for some lost soul and Lord save them, whatever the cost. And then something comes along in our life that may not be the most pleasant. And we don't like that. God says all things work together for good. It might take us going through some hard situation or a difficult time for one of our children or one of our family members to come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. It might take the passing of a, a dear saint of God to bring some of that family to Christ. 
Is that price worth it? You bet. You cannot put a price on a soul. We know that God is for us because he's promised all things will work together. and Many things appear to be working against us. But he causes even those to work for our good. Think back to Joseph and all the things he went through. What his brothers done to him. About him being lied upon against and then tossed into prison. And, and how God brought him out. And he was able to provide for his family. We know that God is forced because he's declared his purpose. The, the purpose of his grace. Verse 29 and 30 contain five unbroken, unbreakable links in the golden chain of God's marvelous purpose for every one of his children. There's foreknowledge, predestination, called, justified, and glorified. Well, I'm glad I'm saved. How about you? I'm glad God is for us. If he's for us, nothing will ever be successfully against us. We know that God is for us because he is guaranteed, guaranteed, our eternal security. Verse 35 through 39. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. All oh, listen to these next two verses. Great verses. How can someone think they can lose their salvation? How can someone think they're greater than God? For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Psalm chapter 37, verse 20, it says we're preserved forever. In Ephesians, it tells us we're sealed by that Holy Spirit of promise. In John 10, it tells us that no one can take us out of his hand. Some folks think they can take themselves out of his hand. Mm -hmm. Are you stronger than God? No. What happens is you become a disobedient child of God. And when you become a disobedient child of God, if you're his, he'll chasten you. He'll take you to the woodshed. Hebrews chapter 12 shows us. And that chastening may not be pleasant. And if we don't come back to the way God wants us to be, his way of thinking, he may just take us out of this old world. In these verses here, 38 and 39, we have the conclusion of this chapter. And they include the evidence here that God is for us. Nothing in time or eternity, in heaven or in earth, no force of evil, nor demon of hell. Absolutely nothing will ever separate us from the Lord and from his love for us. Yes, God is for us. But there's one question we must ask. Ask yourself. How much are we for him? Are we totally sold out for him? Are you on the Lord's side? Or are we living in defeat? We need to banish our fears and doubts and be content with the assurance that since God is for me, who can successfully be against me? If God is for me, I can do all things that he wants me to do. We need to put the message out to the people in our churches, those who come through our doors. As preachers, we need to share this message with them. If you have never accepted God's Son as your Lord and Savior, will you do it this day? Will it be Sunday or a Tuesday or a Wednesday or some special meeting? We have sometimes devotions at different times. We need to always give an invitation out there. Without Jesus Christ, you're lost. Your eternal destination will not be heaven. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Our Lord's not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. God doesn't want anyone to die and go to hell. And the sin that will send a man to hell is rejecting Jesus Christ as Savior. It's not that they said a bad word, had a bad thought, smoked a cigarette, drunk a beer, or something of that nature. The sin that sends a soul to hell is rejecting Jesus Christ as Savior. We let them know. Do they want to be under the condemnation that we've talked about here this morning? We let them know that God loves them. And he wants to save them. Make that invitation strong. 
lot of times we spend a lot of time fishing, a lot of time going through the Word. But when it comes to the end, how much time do we spend setting the hook? That invitation is so important. Will you come? If you were to die today, would heaven be your eternal home? Folks need to realize that it is real. We need to spend much time in prayer for our churches. We need to spend much time in prayer for our people. Preachers, it would be good to get some of those faithful few together. Pick a chosen day. Maybe at 11 o'clock. Get them together and have a time of prayer. Once a week. Once every other week. Prayer is so important. Pray for your church. Pray for the people that come through your doors. We spend more time in prayer for our people, for our churches. We spend more time in prayer for the lost. Each Sunday morning, we say if you have someone that's dear to your heart, maybe family member, co-worker, friend that's lost, this will not save them, but we just want to pray that the Holy Spirit work in their heart. They realize that need of Christ and accept him to slip up a hand. This won't save anybody, but we want the Holy Spirit to do a work there of conviction. We can see victories. We can see souls saved. We can see lukewarm Christians get fired up. But preachers, sometimes we need to be fired up. How can we expect the crowd to be fired up if we're not fired up? If we're not excited about the things, Lord, how can we expect them to be excited? Sometimes we take people for granted. The one that cleans the church, the one who turns the heat on or the lights on or Preacher, you can't do it all. Your wife can't do it all. Find you some good faithful people and enlist them in some of the service that needs to be done. We brought some kids in here a few weeks ago. and We got one of those great old big bouncy houses and it hadn't been sanitized and cleaned in a while. We picked out three or four of them that's a little bit rowdy and said, hey, you guys want to come over like on Thursday night? And Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they came and we sanitized the bouncy house, had a little pizza and some pop and Man, they got excited. They said, when can we come back? When can we come back? So this Thursday, we're hoping to get them to come back. And we got paneling up about four foot on the wall in the auditorium. And we're going to have them furniture polish that. Maybe have some more pizza. Make them a part of it. Let them buy into it. Let them realize that this church is their church. It's their home, too. We need to pray about things. We need to pray that... Uh, God showed the people in our communities, in our area, that he's still God on the throne, that he still saves souls. Show the people around that you're still in a soul-saving business, Lord. God, send revival. May people that see the signs of our church out there see that sign and realize that that's where they need to be. That's where they need to come. That bring conviction that way. They see the steeple out there. May that draw them, attract them to the house of God. We need to pray about those things. God send revival. Psalm 85, 6 says, Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? In our joys in the Lord. May the people that drive by see that sign, feel compelled to come in. May they leave changed. God's in the soul saving business. He's in a life saving business. He's the best recovery coach you'll ever find. Ask God for something. So often we have not because we ask not. Ask God to do something for your church, for your people, and then get ready to be amazed as we see him work. Our little youth group, we started back in September. Uh, due to COVID, we'd not been bringing the young kids in or doing anything with them, and we started that in September. And since we started doing that, we've had more families coming to church. The first, I think, two or three nights we did that, we were running like 30-some kids. Our attendance has jumped from almost single digits now to we're running upper 40s and sometimes lower 50s. At Christmas, we were at 96. And most of those were not churched people, those extra ones. There's a field out there ready to be harvest. God, it's harvest time. We do some planting, do some watering. We're ready for the harvest. Don't forget, if God's for us, 
who can successfully be against us. May God bless our churches and may we see great growth there. Brother Pete.